autumn, season of mists and mellow fruitfulness, and pumpkin-flavoured caffeinated drinks, if that's your thing. But what do markets think of the season, and of September in particular? Not much, if the data is anything to go by. The month of September is historically the worst month for US stocks, stretching back nearly a century. It's led to a saying on markets about the September effect, and warnings, as summer turns to fall, of turbulence ahead. But should September really be feared by investors? Is it all just a statistical quirk? And even if markets do suffer from some seasonal back-to-school jitters, what kind of long-term impact does it even have on investments? Let's try and find out. It's what we do here on Reuters Econ World. Every week, we pick a phrase or buzzword and go deep on the economic principles and ideas driving the biggest news around the world. So this week, the September effect. I'm your host, Carmel Crimmins in Dublin. Okay, before we get kind of down on September, we need to be clear about a few things. Yes, market data stretching back to the 1920s does show that September is the worst average month for trading US stocks. And it's also the only month to average negative returns. But that doesn't mean that stocks will necessarily be down every September. In fact, some years, September has been among the best performing months. So is the September effect just a historical quirk in the data? It's largely discounted by economists because it flies in the face of the idea that financial markets are efficient. But is there something in the market psychology that takes hold? Some seasonal behavioural bias? I'm joined today by Mike Dolan, Editor-at-Large for Financial Markets, based in London. Hi, Mike. Thanks so much for joining me today. Anytime. Glad to be here. Mike, you have a few September trading sessions under your belt. How long have you been covering markets? Many unkind people would say far too long. I have 35 years, I think, is last count, so it's quite a while. Wow. Yeah, so I've seen a few. Don't look a day over 25, Mike Dolan. <laughs> Don't look a day over 25. <laughs> Now, September, it has a bad reputation among investors. <laughs> it's funny because people will argue back and forth about which month is the worst and which month is the best. And there is a great discussion about uh, seasonality, the whole cottage industry and seasonality in financial markets. So mm -hmm. you will find all sorts of yeah. old almanac issues around investment trends and what's best and worst and, and uh, indifferent. But uh, when you do examine the numbers, in, in September is indeed, looking at Wall Street alone, the worst month on average over many decades. But it's not the only month that is negative. Right. And if you change the time horizon on that, you can find different outcomes. But September is pretty constant. And I think it's more than September. It's really those months around the end of the summer. So you start to see negative prints coming out around August, September. And we've had a fair few doozies in relation to big market drawdowns in October too. Yeah. And I think you then have to kind of interrogate people as to why that, this happens. I think the longer the data set, the, the, the further back you go, you're capturing different times and periods and behaviours that perhaps maybe outweigh some of the way in which markets work today. So speaking of interrogating why it is that September might be a bad month, not that we do interrogations on this show, Mike, what are some of the theories as to why September could be a negative month for investors? I think the most prosaic ones are around calendar effects like quarterly accounting. Mm -hmm. financial years, tax accounting. Okay. And many mutual funds in the United States, I believe, still report a financial year at the end of September, which kind of leads to a certain amount of window dressing of their portfolios as they come into that. So the best performing assets, they tend to bank that to flatter the outcome. Right. There is another effect that says as the calendar tax year kind of winds up, 
there is a incentive for people who have made loss making trades or investments to mm -hmm. realize those losses because they can write them off against tax. Uh -huh. So there, there are very real effects that might say that September would lead to more selling than others. There is a simple human behavioral thing that goes on as well. I think people have been usually the July, August periods are periods where people are on holidays and markets are quite thin and portfolios are left untended. Right. And when they come back in September, there tends to be, oh, mm -hmm. what's happened in the interim and let's rejig this a little bit. So hence a little bit more volatility within within trading that may not have been there during the quieter summer months. Right. It's interesting. There has been academic research to suggest that, you know, some of the reasons for the falls are, are the post-holiday blues. So the idea that investors have been off, you know, sunning themselves in the Hamptons or Quinta de Lago or wherever. And so they kind of, they haven't been paying attention. They maybe have missed some negative news and they're kind of playing catch up in September. I, mean, I think that stands to reason, doesn't it? I mean, if there's not a great deal of activity or if the most senior portfolio managers are away, then maybe ju more junior members aren't willing to tamper with those portfolios as much. Yeah. And given any six to 12 week period that you could think of, so much information needs to be assessed and reassessed yeah. so that after those holidays, people come back and rethink the way they're positioned. That's interesting you should mention, you know, the boss, the boss being away and kind of not, not wanting to, to kind of tinker with things or, or maybe, God forbid, disturb them while they're <laughs> having fun. There could be some negative repercussions there. But I had always thought that certainly in the last few years, it's the algorithms, it's the machines who are doing the trading anyway. Like, that seems to be rem a remarkably human explanation for what's going on. Uh, yes, yeah, so this is where this it comes really fascinating because lots of these old investment almanac issues are going back decades and decades when there were all sorts of different regulations and behaviors and, and calendar effects that, that were very real. But if you get a computer to work out what the trading patterns are, you do get into the seasonality thing then. So a computer that's reading what does the market normally do in September <laughs> goes back, interrogates the data and says, normally it's a down month in September. So uh, I see. even if you leave it to the bots, the bots will have just taken what the humans have done for decades. Oh, that's fascinating. And it's, a, it's an interesting aspect of just reinforcing existing patterns. And, and on that note, I think that's the, that's the big takeaway. If, if you're a professional investor or you're somebody who's trading Mm -hmm. continuously in the market, then clearly that's very important to know which is the best month, which is the worst month. Yeah. But if you're somebody with a slightly longer term horizon, if you've got a normal mom and pop investor or you've got a rainy day fund and you're looking at five to 10 years, the seasonality should actually reassure you because if it's seasonal, much like a raging hot July turns to a freezing cold December, yeah. it will wash out. So the more we can identify this as a seasonal effect rather than some fundamental change of thinking in the, either the economy or in the market at large, the more reassuring those down months should be. And I, I suppose we should be clear, we're not saying that every September is negative. No. Like, you know, it's, now, admittedly, it, it's been on a, on a losing streak in recent years, but it, it doesn't mean that September is always negative. And also, actually looking at the data, it is slightly skewed by some big events. You know, there was some September 2008 was when the Lehman Brothers collapsed and September was a particularly bad month during the Great Depression in 1931. I suppose it's just to say that if you were trying to trade or, to, you know, invest around the possibility of a bad September, you might get caught out, right? You might actually miss a good September. Absolutely. And I think, you again, it's all like so much in investment world. It depends on your time horizon. Right. If you can identify a very big crash, like Lehman was a great example, the collapse in September 2008. Yeah. Did take, despite the previous year being relentless bad news for banks and, and world markets, it did actually surprise at the time. And it was a terrible, torrid following three or four months. But at that point, we know what happened since. Yeah. If you've had a 10 year horizon or even a five year horizon, the market would have recovered dramatically at that time. So even when there is big fractures, maybe you don't want to be there having just bought and having your investments collapse in front of you over the next few weeks. But it is depends on the, on the horizon. I, I'll give you the other one, an almanac, an old adage that gets used in the UK quite a lot, which is the whole sell in May and go away, right? Yeah. So that, that's one that kind of goes back. Yeah. And it says, come back on St. Ledger Day, right? And the St. Ledger Day is a very famous horse race in the UK that happens in September. 
Right. And so it's interesting to see what that's telling you as a piece of investment advice is saying the market usually goes up like a rocket in the early part of the year. Yeah. It peaks out. Actually, one of the best months of the year is April. Right. And so this little adage is telling you once the market's high, sell it. Go away, ignore what's happened during the summer, and then buy again in September, mm -hmm. which happens to be the worst month. Interesting. And that, all that's telling you is that if you believe the stock market goes up anyway over time, that as soon as the market pulls back, then buy. Yeah. When it's very high, you can get out. So it's a simple idea that even though September is the worst month, maybe the perfect month to buy. Investors obviously want to kind of to know, to predict, ideally to anticipate how volatile a market is going to be. If it's going to be up and up at a very high level or down, down at a very low level or, or moving all around. So Wall Street has various models, Mike, don't they, to try and predict volatility? The best way to look at it is to what extent can volatility measures within markets or implied volatility measures as they're derived from derivatives and options markets and all, all that kind of very arcane part of the financial structure, they give us a basic idea of, of value at risk. Right? So how, what's the likelihood of your stock index going up or down by X percentage points over the next 30 days? The most used measure of risk over the coming month, for example, is what's known as the, the VIX or the fear index, because mm -hmm. it's often known and so the higher the VIX reading means investors expect more volatility. Yes, that's correct. Right. Okay. And so, so use, why that's useful, and it's useful for all investment models, is that it's trying to give you a sense of how much that stock or how much that stock index can move up or down over the period. And that's the amount of, that's the highest you can lose, right? And that's really important too, because even for professionals, there are many investment funds, many kind of mutual funds in Europe, for example, which can't hold stocks that are above a certain volatility level. Wow. Or at least they can't market them to retail investors, to your, your household investor. Huh. Because the potential risk within them is considered too high. So even the bond markets and the currency markets will use the VIX as a, a gauge or one gauge. There are many, but that will be a central gauge in what you described at the start as these value at risk models. Yeah. And so the movement in the VIX, and, and one of the reasons the VIX is used is quite liquid, it's traded independently. So people will buy futures. Right. So people buy it itself. Exactly. Yeah. And so this is, again, the wisdom of crowds idea that the more trading there is in any particular theory, the more accurate that should be over time. The problem with this as a measure of predicting the future is that, of course, it's prone to speculation of its own. Uh -huh. And that's one of the problems we got to last month. So August gives us a perfect real-world example of the VIX in action. How did it do, Mike? Yeah, well, the start of August was a, was, a, was a wild explosion of volatility. Maybe remind us, what was the, what was the, what was the cause for it all? I, actually, I have to confess, I was on vacation, so I kind of missed it. <laughs> <laughs> Looky me. What was the, yeah, what was the root of it all? It's a very good question because I think you'll, you, it depends on who you'll talk to, you'll get, get different answers to this. Oh. And this kind of spins us back into the issue in question. Hmm. But broadly speaking, there were three possibilities as to why a sudden jump in volatility. Right. One was that there had been a buildup, speculate, speculative trades in the Japanese yen, which is a favorite interest rate play given, given the Japanese interest rates are so low. Okay. In a low volatile market, that trade can build and build and build, and it did. And the triggers for the shift, Bank of Japan raised interest rates mm -hmm. slightly earlier than many people had expected. And the outsized reaction was a puncturing of that little bubble. So that was one reason. The second reason was that recession, that big R word, yeah. had lunged onto the radar and with the last US unemployment report. And the third thing was that the great big theme that slipped to the stock market almost endlessly for the last 18 months has been artificial intelligence. And we were in the middle of the earnings season in the US. Yeah. And many of the big tech, the magnificent seven of these huge big mega cap stocks were suddenly being questioned about to how much they were pumping into AI investments and whether there was an end case 
emerging yet in that whole theme. So those three things came together and we had an unbelievable explosion in volatility over a one or two day period. But part of the reason that that had happened, if you take away all those three possible reasons, is that we had 356 days in which the S&P 500 had not fallen more than 2%. Wow. That's a long time for such relatively benign conditions to persist. Obviously, if you've got a very, very low volatility, then it reduces implied volatility. Yeah. And then you get a trade and you get a suppression, as some people would say, right, of the proper measure of risk in the market going forward. And that creates a little bubble of its own. Yeah. And I think in the middle of or the beginning of August, that in itself was one that was punctured along with the three other aspects that we had outlined. So it was a perfect storm in some respects. But the key bit there for all of that, that's internal market trading. Yeah. Uh, A lot of what was going on within volatility trades and yen trades and carry trades, all those slightly esoteric behaviors within the financial markets itself had been independent of any change in the fundamental outlook for the broader economy or for interest rates or all the important stuff that dictates the valuation of the markets going forward. And so we got an explosion over two or three days yeah, and it dissipated almost as quickly as it arrived. And that's not the first time we've seen that happen. So the median VIX level, as I understand it, is around 17. So how high did it hit in early August? It really was extraordinary. And as I said at the outset, been looking at these things for 35 years or so, it's rare to have seen one or two days quite as dramatic as that. It got 65 at one point. What? Wow. It, it, it was off the scale. And we did get one other similar episode back in early 2018. Mm. Something that was dubbed Volmageddon. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Rather ominously. But it was dubbed that because it was, again, independent of what was going on around the fundamentals, if you like, of the market. It happened due to the speculative activity within options markets and within volatility markets itself. If an awful lot of money is in that market, you can see the outsized reactions when the bubble is popped. Mm-hmm. And that, I think, is more what we saw in early August rather than being a warning signal of something terrible coming down the pike. Is volatility a good thing sometimes, Mike? Like, is it good in terms of flushing out some of the riskier trades? Higher volatility? Yeah. Well, well, think of what it's doing. All it's doing in many respects is giving you an indication of the sort of risks ahead. Right. And so it's important that it's a good reality check. It's important that it's some way reflecting those risks because then it makes to better decision making. Mm -hmm. If you're going to take risk in a higher risk asset, if you're going to take a position in it, then you have to be pretty convinced that there is an economic environment or a broader investment case for it. If you're just buying it because volatility is very low and you just think you can buy the riskiest thing on the planet because it's the risk of any big movement in markets is low, then that can lead to bad decision making. And I think that's a little of what we saw in early August. The market can chase its own tail continuously for long periods of time. And unfortunately, when you're talking about hundreds of billions and nay trillions of dollars that then get put into risk that's not terribly well justified by the fundamentals, yeah. then, it, then you do have a problem. Whereas when volatility is higher, or at least volatility gauges are higher, then they're giving you a a more accurate warning of the risk you're taking. Mm -hmm. And in the end, August turned out to be a pretty good month for the stock market. People would have been pulling their hair out in that first week of August. And by the end of the month, the market ended up quite smartly. So again, it's so much about your time horizon. Yeah. And even even though you could get a terrible week in September, it it won't necessarily endure unless there is a, a more fundamental reason for that. And, and we have to remember this year, more than any other year, we've got an, a very big election coming up in November. So we're entering the final quarter of the year at a time which, given the White House race and how tight it still is, could well be volatile around that moment. We, we really don't know. It's often at least temporarily volatile around the outcome of, the, of tight elections, at least. Mm-hmm. And so, so that's a very big consideration this year as we approach the final quarter and September is, I guess, the last month 
to reconsider that. That's it for this week's episode of Reuters Econ World. A big thank you to Mike Dolan and everyone covering markets at Reuters. You can check out their coverage on Reuters.com and the Reuters app. A reminder, there's a newsletter to accompany this show. You can sign up for it on Reuters.com or the app. Sound design, music composition and engineering on this episode was by Josh Summer. Our podcast team includes Kim Vanell, Tara Oakes, Gail Issa, Jonah Green, David Spencer, Christopher Wall Jasper and Sharon Wright Garson. Our executive producer is Leela de Kretzer. Remember, for all your daily news, check out our weekday show, Reuters World News. You can catch it on the Reuters app or wherever you listen to your podcasts.